so identify as Chicano is, is usually um, has uh, with it comes with it comes a certain set of politics with it comes a certain set of like kind of anti-imperial politics now some people just use the word Chicano and and, and it doesn't right but historically that that really to, to, to be a Chicano to be part of what is considered the Chicano movement uh, is really to take on some very anti-imperial politics Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Ramiro with Anticonquista. Anticonquista is an anti-imperialist media collective. Our content is produced by and for the Latin American and Caribbean diaspora. And today we have one of our good comrades on the show, Matt Cedillo, talking about the history of Chicano resistance. Today we're going to go over a little bit about what does it mean to be Chicano? What is the lived experiences of the Chicano people, of the Mexican people, indigenous people, all people in the, the quote-unquote United States and the Southwest who have a very similar lived experience and are going through a lot of the similar oppressions. Even today, during COVID-19, as we see so many frontline workers and the most oppressed people, especially out here in LA, a lot of whom are Chicano and are Mexican, Indigenous, Latin American. And so, we want to go over a little bit about the history of Chicano resistance in in the in the Western Hemisphere to talk about its origins, the history, um, maybe some of the debates within the Chicano movement about where to go next. Um, and so, Matt, thanks for joining us, Anticonquista. Uh, I appreciate you having me. So, Matt is an internationally touring poet and one of the four founders of Teleaguar which produces media and analysis for Aguar Nation. Make sure to go and follow Tele Jaguar right now on IG, Facebook, go to their website, uh, tele-jaguar, um, and make sure to follow their content. It's really good, and I think it's on the cutting edge of independent, revolutionary, Latino, Chicano media that is not guided by NGOs and not guided by corporate interests, but is really speaking uh, for the people in a way that the people speak. Um, so tell us a little bit first, before we get into the history of Chicano resistance, tell us about um, Tele Aguar. Well, you know, Tele Aguar, it really kind of, um, we put it together. Initially, it was me and Ernesto Ayala who talked about putting, uh, putting you know, working together and doing something. He was uh, running the La Raza Unida page for, for many years and had tons of followers. And uh, I had been running something called the Southwest Political Report. And we've been putting uh, content on there, but we weren't really working directly. It was more like kind of this informal kind of thing. And we'd always talked about doing something uh, more formally, just like the two of us. And then uh, as the wheels kind of got started turning, it was kind of during, you know, Mecha, uh, when there was all that, this big struggle over the name change and people who were for it, people who were opposed to it. Um, this kind of thing broke out that, you know, we were you know, like, OK, we're going to finally going to do it. Well, what are we going to call it? Um, around that time, somebody who was a real agitator for for that um, uh, he, he kind of mockingly called everybody who was against the name change uh, a bunch of Chicano bros in Jaguar suits. And so, you know, the way when me and Ernesto are, we take a joke and we, we, we run with it. So that was like why it became, it was a combination of Telesur and then, you know, and then and then and the Jaguar, right? So like, so we became Telahawar. And then so that's kind of how that, that, that all came about, well, why the name came about. So, you know, Ernesto, he's big, he's a, he's a member of uh, La Raza Unida. He's been a part of that organization, like essentially all his whole life. His father was a, a kind of a mover shaker in the organization. And I saw the opportunity like, well, you know, what we need to do is is get somebody from Union del Barrio as well. So this can like, you know, really be something that can really uh, spread out and, 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 and incorporate, um, you know, essentially the two most kind of important, you know, Chicano organizations or the lo two larger ones. I shouldn't say that. I mean, I won't piss anybody off, but like the two, you know, these really, really important historic organizations and kind of be a bridge. It, it, as, a, as, a, as a kind of proposes media outlet. So that's kind of that, that started. But this is nothing, nothing's been done yet at this point. Then Karina uh, Acria Pais, she comes in and uh, and she essentially has all the technical know-how how to build up these these things 
um, how to build up a group. Uh, she'd done a lot of work with digital smoke signals, and et cetera, et cetera. So then she came in, and uh, and then she, you know, helped us like develop daily content, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Ernesto also has a lot of experience in building up a, a web platform. So that's kind of like how the how it started, right? And uh, we really got began in earnest in like January, right? That was really when it happened. And, and since then, we've got something like nine thousand nine hundred likes and 12,900 followers we probably got a lot of spies <laughs> just watching us um but uh but that's kind of uh that's uh that's it's it's grown you know relatively fast i think i don't know so that's like um uh, so we're really really excited about it but the content we provide is, is 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 essentially um the way we like to describe it is that we draw um our analysis from you know examination of historical dates facts you know, stats, you know, we, we draw our analysis from the material world and then we draw our direction from uh, the movimiento, from, 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 from what is demanded of us um, at the time, you know what I'm saying? But we, we, we look at the world, we try to look at the world as it is and analyze it, you know, basic historical materialism. And then we actually, and we, and we have our direction guided um, by, by the events of the world. So we're not, we're not playing word games that interconnect with each other, you know? Explain to us the origins of the word Chicano. What does it mean and how would you classify someone as Chicano or Chicana? Well, the, the term Chicano, I mean, there, there's a lot of like theories as to its origin. I know that Robert, uh, Roberto uh, Cindy Rodriguez has some theories. I know um, various other scholars have theories as to where it comes from. I mean, we all kind of know it generally began as kind of a, a classification, kind of a slur, kind of kind of something that like w w you were looked at as, as is you know it was not it was not something that you'd want to attach to your name it was kind of a, a way of categorizing people as you know as bad right um and then you know eventually it got taken on by you know uh, a movement and embraced as this idea of like you know the, the chicanos as, as separate and distinct from you know um general america you know like to within america uh but also different from people who are you know uh, of of mexican national origin right it's kind of like you know um you know, kind of politics, right? Um, and so that that's kind of the, the general context uh, of where um, where the idea comes from. Um, what what it really has come to mean, though, is to embrace the Chicano identity is is very is separate and distinct from 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 what would be gen general Mexican American identity. Like uh, it, it's come to mean something quite different. Uh, to be to identify as Chicano is is usually um, has. Uh, it, it, with it comes it, with it comes a certain set of politics with it comes a certain set of like kind of anti imperial politics now some people just use the word chicano and and, and it doesn't right but historically that that really to, to to be a chicano to be part of what is considered the chicano movement uh is really to take on some very anti imperial politics it is really to take on take on the state to see yourself as separate and distinct from from just you know the US as a whole so that that's kind of um that's yeah that that, that I mean it's it's for me, I, I try to keep it simple, you know, like, you know, it's uh, there are people who are of Mexican origin um, and increasingly it's, it's become just like if you're born in these areas and this land that was once Mexico and you're kind of subject to the same kind of conditions um, that people historically have experienced in those places. I mean, if you want, you can be Chicano. If you don't want it, though, I don't want to I don't want to get into word games and fight with people over these things. But there's a certain set of conditions that you're going to experience um, <laughs> if, you're, if, you're, if you're thought to be or if you are Mexican. Um, but you know, increasingly that's changing. Increasingly that's changing. I mean, like as the Central American migration has uh, come into um, these areas, um, this kind of the demonization of Central Americans um, as distinct and, and having that very particular history, and people becoming more and more aware of, of those those distinct differences, um, it creates its own thing. And uh, and those, but the, the condition is also bad. So like so, so I don't want to say everybody everybody here is a Chicano, but I don't, I'm not. That's not that's not what it is. But but you are subject to the long-standing history. Uh, that comes out directly, you know, essentially directly out of the Mexican-American War. Yeah, I think I think that's a good approach to it. And I'm glad that you preface it by mentioning that you don't want to get into word battles with people, because I think it's so important. At the end of the day, like we all have shit to learn. You know, we're all learning. We're all growing. We're all studying. I myself, like I mentioned to you once before, I was born and raised in New York. We were never exposed to Chicano history, Chicano movement. I know very little about it compared to people out here and in, in, in the West Coast. Um, and so I think it's so good that you have an approach where you're saying, you know, let's debate, let's dialogue, let's learn, 
because I always see these kind of like social media Twitter beefs of like, oh, what does it the pure Chicano term mean or this or that or like disagreements. And it's like we're all acting as if we know the sum total of the subject, but we're also learning about it. And um, and I'm, I'm just glad you mentioned that because I think it's one of those topics that unfortunately can bring some drama with it. Um, before we go into some of the history of how the Chicano nation developed and, and how Chicano people uh, came about, tell us about um, the impact of U.S. expansionism in northern Mexico. Uh, obviously, we know into the, 18, the 1800s, you have uh, the growth of U.S. imperialism, the U.S. as a rising empire spreading across the planet, beginning with uh, parts that are uh, northern Mexico. So tell us about that impact. How did that affect the people of the area? Um, and and what are, were the long standing consequences of that expansionism? Right. So, I mean, like a lot of people begin this looking at this in like the 1840s um, with the Mexican-American War. But really, actually, it, 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 you know, it predates that. And you can you can you can make the argument goes back to the 1400s. But but just keeping it for the purpose of this conversation, really have to look at the 1830s, right? Because that's that's a, that's a period of like a settlement in Texas um, that leads to a lot of what, what comes later and what what is erroneously described uh, by by Texas historians as the Texas Revolution, right? And uh, that includes people like Steve Austin, um, Stephen Austin, as well as uh, you know Sam Houston, and the formation of the Texas Rangers um, in the 1830s. Later on, in, you know California, the um, in the aftermath of the Mexican American War, you know the the, the the, the California Rangers was set up in the 1850s, um, and later followed by the Colorado Rangers, and then, and, the, and the New Mexican Range mounted something or other, you know, vigilante groups, and as well as a, you know, basically in all these areas, a, a ranger system was established, right? In all these, all these states that were once, were once Mexico, and with that also came a series of set of laws, and the, the ones I'm most familiar with, um, and I think that are really important, are to look at, uh, you know, the, uh, the Foreign Miners Tax of 1850. And the Greaser Act of 1855. Now, the Foreign Miners Tax of 1850 is really interesting because it happens in, in 1850, one year after 1849, which of course everyone knows, you know, is the gold rush, right? So they establish this thing called the Foreign Miners Tax, meaning that like you're not allowed to, you know, compete essentially. Um, it was barring, you know, Mexicans from competing within the gold rush. So these laws. Um, and all these kind of things. I remember I was going to do a, a project with Luis Rodriguez, and I, I wish I had the, the this on on. on uh, I wish I had the exact information on this. But he was talking about these the, these uh, vagrant cow laws, right? Where like you could go to jail if you had these vagrant cows, you know, like. And so, um, I don't know how you have a vagrant cow. So I mean, there's all these kinds of like ridiculous, absurd uh, laws, and you know. At the time, all these all these you know Mexican landlords they were trying to comply with them, a lot of them, but there was no way to comply with them because the essential thing that was going on was the proletarization of this population, right? And I don't really know of too many examples anywhere in the world that more almost exactly mirror the thing that Karl Marx was talking about when he talked about like primitive accumulation as the the early um, Chicano or Mexican American experiences um, that happened. You're talking about groups of people who kind of like worked in kind of a landed system who kind of this that the other they had some they owned, they owned some land they, they were farmers right and there this 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 these these new laws were enacted in order to grab that land and turn them into and, and turn them into like you know inert workers and then after that to penalize them right so then you have the greaser act of 1855 which essentially was a vagrancy law um a series of vagrancy laws which were applicable i believe the exact term was about uh, to indians of mexican descent right which really could have been anybody um and so that really was a uh, um a mechanism to to force people into you know being destitute proletariat or you know it's colonialism so that was kind of um that was those things that happened there was that that initial dispossession and then to this day we see people um, of Mexican extract uh, living in the United States uh, as part of a larger group of people that are called, you know, the Latinos, um, who are, um, you know, shoulder to shoulder with everyone else, who also have different histories. Um, but we see this, we see ourselves at the bottom of the pay scale, and we see ourselves as uh, people group people who are getting COVID at the highest rates. So there's a there's a history to that you know and whether the history we're talking about is mexican war or we're talking about the colonization of puerto rico whether we're talking about um you know filibusters in uh, in central america there's a history to this right there's a history to uh, our, our first our dispossession and later our proletarization um our hyper proletarization 
hyper exploitation, super profits, uh, based on getting you know ripped out of our backs. And so for the the Chicanos, this this period takes place in the 1840s. That that period of really primitive accumulation of the Anglo Americans, um, of of the land, the labor, and the resource. That's so. Um... That's so interesting because around that same time period, I'm glad you mentioned the filibusters. You know, one of the areas of history that I think is insane is this guy named uh, William Walker, which we've talked about before on Anticonquista. Some crazy white guy from like Louisiana or Tennessee or somewhere in the Confederacy in the South who declared himself president of Nicaragua and sent an invading force and declared himself president. And at that time period in the 1840s, 1850s, the British and the Confederates actually had some disputes in Nicaragua over control of their land, their canal, like access to build a canal that would allow ships to go from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean and thus be able to go to California and the West Coast um, to, to for mining and for gold, because as you mentioned before, the gold rush. And so it's interesting to see how it's all interconnected because like you say, so many people view Chicano history and Chicano, the people as so like uh, disconnected and not related to anything else, but it's entirely connected to, you know, people from Nicaragua because the, 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 the slaveocracy that was trying to take control of Nicaragua, make it a slave plantation and build a canal through it. They were ultimately trying to, you know, enslave like people all the way in the north and in, in, in the West Coast and, and Cali and Mexico, northern Mexico. Tell us a little bit, just give us a, a general layout. What were some of the states that were uh, expanded into by the United States that were taken over? Um, and who were some of the indigenous peoples that did exist or still exist there today um, that are that are part of those lands? Oh, well, yeah, of course, you have California. Uh, that's obviously, you know, one of the larger ones. Texas, the other really large one. Uh, New Mexico. I mean, the, 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 the list is uh, the California, Nevada, uh, Utah, parts of uh, Colorado, um, parts of Wyoming, um, Texas, New Mexico, uh, Arizona. So those are like the, the, the totality of the states. And, and, you know, and throughout, you know, the indigenous peoples, um, there are people that, that, that are on, on both sides of, of the border. I mean, yeah, like the Yaquis, um, you know, um, I mean, there's just, there's so many different peoples. I mean, there, there's, uh, you know, here we, here we are in LA, this is Tongva. And then, um, I don't know. I mean, like I just go on. I mean, the Navajo Nation, obviously in New Mexico, um, all kinds, uh, you know, all kinds of different, there's all many different uh, indigenous nations uh, in this, in these territories. Um, or in, in in this area, so I mean, like they're you know, you know they fought with the with the, the long standing you know wars with the U.S. government, um, and and standing wars with the Mexican government. I mean, like, you know, like right. uh, fighting for you know fighting fighting against this possession, fighting against the, the seizure of, of of their their land, labor, and resource. Um, as not, I mean, like, and it's really important to think about that in terms of you know, like when we think about indigenous risks, it's not like, it's not some like magical spiritual thing. We're talking about like, it, I mean, it, it can be. I mean, it can be a very spiritual thing. Resistance is very spiritual, I suppose, but it, it it's not completely dissimilar from anyone struggling anywhere in the world. It's not this mystical thing. It's really important to demystify these things. The people struggle for land, labor, and resource. Yeah, it's scientific. Yeah, it's scientific. Yeah, it, it, exactly. and no matter who you're talking about, it's scientific. Right. And so that that I think that's really a really key thing to to look at. But it's interesting that you mentioned though uh, when you mentioned uh, you're talking about uh, uh, William Walker, but like you know initially this guy is backed by Vanderbilt, right? Yeah. And so that's kind of a really interesting thing because I think oftentimes when we talk about the Mexican American War, this expansionist war, oftentimes it's talked about in this way where it's um where it's a, a precursor to the Civil War or it's a, a, a subchapter of the Civil War. Um, it's, you know, we look at the slaveocracy as really wanting to get this land to expand um, territories in which they can grow cotton, in which they can grow foodstuffs, in which they can essentially expand the slave trade, right, as well. And in reality, it's actually, yes, that's true. They did want they did want to do that. But it's also true that the northern industrialists had every, every uh, design on newly acquired lands as well. I mean, that's also true. So what they like to do, what people who make that argument like to do is cherry pick some uh, speeches by Abraham Lincoln uh, that are kind of opposed to the Mexican-American War. Okay, well, you know, and say like, well, look, this is, this is, this is, you know, clearly the Northern Industrialists were not interested in that. Um, but, you know, Abraham Lincoln wasn't the first uh, nominee for the Republican Party. That was John Fremont. 
right? And John Fremont was definitely not opposed to the Mexican-American War. This is the first Anglo, you know, governor or whatever of uh, of California. This is the person that set up the California Rangers in search of, uh, you know, the quote-unquote five Joaquins, right, in which uh, someone uh, supposedly, Joaquin Murieta, was, was, was caught and beheaded, and they toured his head around in a jar for like 40 years until... Yeah, tell us about him. I actually, I, I'm glad you mentioned Joaquin Murieta because, um, you know, I live out here like in Monterey Park, close toward East LA. And um, on, in East LA, like, um, I think it's on Atlantic and uh, Whittier. There's like a, a big building and it has like a mural of Joaquin Murieta. I, I saw the guy, like I saw him on the on the thing. I was like, is that who I think it is? And then I looked it up, and I, I believe it is. Um, and who is he, and like, what role does he have in the history of Chicano resistance? Because I know to, to um, many people, they view him as kind of like uh, similar, maybe kind of in the way to like a, a Robin Hood or like someone who is defending working class people. Okay, well, so he is, he is the inspiration for Zorro. Like, that's a fact. He's an inspiration for Zorro. I mean, this is admitted. This is, like, by the author's own admission. Uh, and then Zorro is, is, is thought to be the, the, uh, the, what do you call it, the, um, the inspiration of Batman. So, I mean, like, again, this is not separate and distinct, right? Joaquin Murieta becomes Zorro. Zorro becomes Batman. Um, but, um, but uh, you know, Joaquin Murieta is a guy who, who may or may not have, I mean, there's a lot of, like, mystery around, like, who he actually was and was this really there or, I mean, there's all kinds of questions, but what is a fact is that they, 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 there were, there was resistance, right? And there was uh, a number of, of groups of people um, uh, that that were resisting. Uh, like I said, like we were talking about earlier, like uh, these these new, the Anglo invasion, as well as these new laws that were making life impossible for people. So a series of people arose, um, fighting back, um, and you know this Joaquin Murieta was was one of them. And so Joaquin Murieta. Uh, eventually was tracked down by the California Rangers or they claimed to have tracked down them. I mean, there's a lot of dispute as to whether this was, was really him. He cut off somebody's head, right? And, and they tore it in a jar. It's like, this is an example of like California justice, right? Um, and uh, that was that was kept. I mean, that was grizzly kept, you know, uh, in, a, in a museum until I think it was lost in a, in a the earthquake, uh, San Francisco, the great, the, great, the great earthquake. So, this is the kind of stuff that uh, this is the kind of this is the kind of things that that happened in that early period, and that's an early period of what would be like I would consider like um, the kind of like the eugenic eugenicist racist period, you mm. know, uh, in American history. Uh, yeah. That that really is like it's in the blood, it's in the wherever. Uh, I say that this era, which is not to say that that's ever really gone away, but but it's not as dominant, right? So now I would say today we're dominated by mysterious statistics. Right. Like we have a race, we have a racist order that is dominated by mysterious statistics. So we'll give you all these statistics about how all these like discrepancies and disparities and how these disparities arose is a mystery. We have yeah. no idea how these things happen. But here they are. Look at this. You know, like, look at these look at these rates of incarceration. Look at these rates of, uh, of, um, of health. Look at these rates of this. It's a mystery as to how this happened. But isn't it a shame or isn't it evidence that these people just don't can't get it together right but it, it's not which is not to say the eugenicist arguments don't have gone anywhere i mean look at look at the you know talking about like the, you know, the china virus et cetera, et cetera. i mean but there's still um it's not as dominant as it once was like you know the, the, the statistical mystery uh racist argument seems to be more popular uh in our area um but back then it was it was much more you know much more it, you know it yeah was. and that goes on that goes on um uh, into, into later periods yeah definitely and going into like sort of the the early ninth early to mid 1900s you know we have the um the world war one in 1914 and uh, world war two obviously at that time period as you mentioned there was growing racism against people who identified as chicanos and and a pre systematic oppression poverty displacement um, the, you know, the creation of just like dr liquor stores and casinos in their area and, and the systematic, um, oppression against Chicanos and Mexican, uh, origin people in the area going into world war two, there's an, uh, historical event that happened that really catches my attention. And that also the, the aesthetic has also been, uh, co-opted by us imperialism in by media 
um, in terms of what they call the, quote, Zoot Suit Riot uh, in 1943, um, or some people call it the Zoot Suit Uprising. Um, and it involved a group of people called the, um, who were referred to as Pachucos. So give us a sense of what was the Zoot Suit Uprising clear up some of the misconceptions about who actually started that conflict, right? Because it seems like the narrative that we get is that it was just these crazy Chicanos who were just beating up soldiers or something like that. When it was the, like the opposite, like, the, you know, the Chicanos and Mexicans were being um, beaten up, humiliated on their own land um, by by people in the army. And, and so tell us about kind of like the anti-imperialist nature of it, um, of the Zoot Soup uprising, uh, who are the Pachucos and what impact does that have in Chicano and U.S. culture in general? Right, right. So, so you know, we looking at the, I, I, I would say it was both. It was both uh, the Zoot Soup riots and the Zoot Soup uprising, right? So the riots on the behalf of the Marines, you know, like the Marines were the, were the riots. It was like, a, a, you know, it's, it's interesting the way people talk about uh, U.S. history, they talk about race riots, right? And the race riots are always when people rebel, right? Um, they never talk about, you know, they never talk about, like, you know, white people burning down entire cities and stuff like that. They don't, they don't, they don't call those race riots. They call that something. They'll, they don't talk about it, actually, but they'll, but uh, if they do, they'll, they'll, they'll call it something else. But, yeah, so in many ways, yeah, the Zuzu riots, the, the riots of the Marines, right? Um, but the rebellion, the uprising, was the fighting back. And, yeah, they did fight back. And so... But you know, if you really look at what happened, it, it was it was horrific. I mean, you had uh, you had uh, cabs of Marines coming down, people just coming down, coming down. I once saw this documentary with this, this older white lady, and she was uh, test she was not testifying. She was like just just telling her story, and she was talking about how she was driving down. You know, she seemed a sweet old lady. But she was talking about, yeah, I was driving down the Marines. We had to get those pachucos. What were they doing? Who did they think they were? Right. And so, like that was kind of that that kind of attitude, um, it, the participation, the because it, it's not just the state, it's 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 and, and it, this was a an extra legal thing that was going on. This was not the Marines being deployed. This was like the Marines of their own will doing this, not being stopped by the police, uh, not being and having general participation of of Anglo LA uh, in the, in this thing. And so they you know they were but they were riding like you know. 200 deep into 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 East LA, finding any zoot suit they could and and beating them down. And so eventually, you know, you know, I should say eventually. I mean, like almost immediately, you know, people began fighting back, and then you know, it resulted in a lot of brawling and a lot of this. But but this is also coming, you know, the zoot riots also coming uh, uh, off of uh, the Sleepy Lagoon uh, murder case, right? And for those who don't know that much about Sleepy Lagoon murder, um, the Sleepy Lagoon case, uh, what had happened was there was a there was a fight, somebody got stabbed, and um, the LAPD responded by by making these huge sweeps into into East LA and just like throwing everybody in jail and like and there's this incident known as Bloody Christmas that comes out of that. Um, but what I would actually do, what I would actually encourage, is for people to look it up when you find it online. It's a little difficult to find. But you do a Google search and find it. Uh, something called the Airs Report, right? That came out of Sleepy Lagoon, right? The Sleepy Lagoon murder case. And in the Airs Report, it was actually this is actually expert testimony um, in the case. And, uh, and 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 this guy is talking about like Mexicans love to stab because it's in their Aztec nature, it's in their Aztec blood to like stab, right? Like like they don't shoot so much as they stab because it, it comes and that dates back to to you know the the the, the Aztec sacrifices where and this is like you know, this is in nineteen forty nineteen forty three so like this is a this is a pretty this is a pretty uh, uh it, it's it's a pretty damning statement. But you're also looking at it's happening in Los Angeles. It's only seven years removed from the end of opera um, of, uh, of the Mexican Repatriation Act, you know, in which uh, anywhere between 500,000 to 2 million Mexicans were deported from the United States. It's estimated today that maybe 60 percent of them were American born. Um, I know my own grandfather was caught up in that. And so, like, this is like not that far removed. Los Angeles is a huge area. Uh, in which uh, people were targeted, just thrown on buses and, and, and pulled out of the country. So um, this is, you know, the, the anti-Mexican um, his, 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 uh, wave uh, was very, very strong in Los Angeles at the time. So like that, uh, you know, that it, it's not just like this thing happened. You know, it, 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 it's there's very recent history right before that that leads to uh, to this animosity. And, and the way the U.S. is, is that, you know, they commit one horrible crime after another. And um, each subsequent crime confirms the righteousness of the previous crime, right? So, like, you know, you do something horrible, 
I mean, you can just look at personal relationships or just the way people are, uh, you know, like abusive people, they do horrible things. And then in order to like make sure that was okay, they do it again. <laughs> you know, so I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously there's an economic driver, there's all kinds of things, but if you're talking about the cultural landscape of this, the, 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 the you know, the, the brutality of it, right? Because you can have like capitalist exploitation without having this level of brutality, um, but the level of brutality, this colonial level of brutality, uh, has to be reified. You have to you, you you justify your previous crimes by committing more. And so, like, um, if you look at the, the the terrible things that came out of uh, of of the Marines' attacks on the community, um, what immediately predates that is the government um, forcibly removing uh, people from the country in, in a horrible fashion. In a horrible fashion that you know would, would leave people out in the desert. I mean, it was it wasn't it was it was not a it was a, it, was a, it was a brutal period. I was reading about the um, the the Zutsu uprising, and I was I thought it was so cool how the the whole style of like the the big pants and the the big like suits, and um, how that came about. Like because supposedly during World War II there was like a tax or something on like wool or or like the correct me if I'm wrong, but it was like a, a there was like a limit on the amount of wool or something that you could use in your clothes, and if you had more, you were seen as like extravagant and un-american and you know we're in the wartime we're in world war ii you need to defend the u.s and so like these people from like the barrios were just like pro in, in protest against these wars against other colonized global south people somewhere else you know uh colonized global south people in the diaspora in you know in places like la in places like san antonio are are rocking like these big outfits in protest against um that US imperialist attitude. And I think it's a beautiful thing because even if I walk out of my spot right now, I can still see, you know, homies on the block wearing like the big shorts or the big shirts. And it, and I see it as like a, an anti-imperialist kind of thing, you know, like fuck your um standardized racist understanding of like these like tight fitting suits and patriotic and and it's so um it's so cool to me to see that you know i think that's beautiful yeah well people should check out uh the work of like lalo guerrero who's known as like kind of like one of the like the, the original Pachuco king of like or like writing a lot of that a lot of that music um but of course this is all influenced by you know african-american like jazz culture this is all influenced by cab calloway uh you know that's kind of like the original like zoot suit kind of where, where that where that kind of comes from, or or at least who popularized it, anyways. Cap Calloway is you know the guy popularized it for for you know just general American culture. So like that's kind of like you know that's it's really important to uh, to acknowledge that and remember that and you know like look look at the the history of that. Um, but for those interested, more interested in learning about like the specific history of the, the Chicano Pachucos, uh, yeah, look into the history of uh, Lalo Guerrero. That that's uh, that's that's where it's at. I'm not an expert on that. I, mean, I can't I can't expand more than tell you to look into it. <laughs> Right, for sure. No, and um, and a few decades later, you know, in the '60s, I think it were one of the most revolutionary decades of the 20th century. There was so many, the rise of so many movements. You know, you had on the East Coast and in Chicago, you had the Young Lords Party, which supported uh, liberation for Puerto Rican people, Boricua people, on the island. Um, you had the Black Panther Party in Oakland and New York, all over the U.S. Right, I believe 1965 or 1966 around there, um, and eventually you also have the rise of the Brown Berets, right, around 1967, 1968, um, and there were a lot of connections between the Brown Berets, the Panthers, and the Lords. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what, who were the Brown, uh, the Brown Berets? What were the conditions that led up to them forming in the first place? Because I know, like earlier, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, civil rights. And I know in 1966, um, there was the Miranda versus Arizona case, right? Um, and you see this rise in, like, popular sentiment among Chicanos and Mexicans in the U.S. who are like, you know, fuck this country. You're going to, like, Vietnam to kill people. You're not even giving us ourselves rights you know, so like, how did the Brown Berets start building and, and organizing in response to the lack of faith in like the U.S. legal and, and political system? Well, so I think it's really interesting to look at um, uh, what kind of the Brown Berets and what, uh, you know, Raza Unida and what various other, you know, parties and groups of people that really, even if they didn't form necessarily in the 60s, I mean, like, you know, Brown Berets, obviously, but like groups of people that even had their origins before that, what they were actually like, 
uh, what they were breaking from, right? And a lot of what they were breaking from, what, it's not just the conditions they were at, because the conditions are constant, right? But they were actually breaking from kind of the variable, which is like what, what people's resistance actually is. So if you look at like uh, at what was coming out of the period, uh, the 40s and 50s, you have like groups like LULAC forming, um, but even more interesting to me, well, and LULAC's kind of interesting, it's funny because right now they're, they're really in a lot of trouble because uh, of what happened in New Mexico. Yeah. Uh, one of their members was talking, <laughs> was defending these like statues of conquistadors. Now they're fighting with the Chicanos. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a mess, right? Um, but 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 in their in their in their defense, he's they're they're saying he was rogue. I don't know. I don't I don't want I don't want to throw. I don't I don't want to. I don't, don't want to like fight with them either. But 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 you know the the the, the truth is though, Lulac played a very important role at a period of time where where Mexicans are being shot, being beat up, and you know, horrible things are happening. Uh, and the American GI Forum is very similar. American GI Forum comes out of a period. Um, it comes out specifically out of this one case. I, I wrote it down, but I don't have his name right in front of me right now. Um, there's Felix Longoria, uh, uh, um, uh, an American vet of uh, of one of these imperial wars, uh, comes back or Chicano, you know, um, comes back from one of these imperial wars and is refused burial in a in a in a cemetery. Right? And they say we won't bury him. We don't bury Mexicans here. And so that's kind of where the American GI Forum kind of came out of that. That initial kind of case um, created all kinds of controversy, created all kinds of like um, righteous anger that, you know, like, how dare you, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and so but that is really very, very typical, though, of not just the Chicanos, not just Mexicans, not just wherever. That's very typical of in, in the United States, this concept around um, uh, veterans coming back and not – being and, and and still experiencing racism, right? There's a constant throughout thing, um, and, and not even just that, and not even racism. Because if you think about like today, when we talk about the amount of homeless veterans, people get really upset. Like, someone could serve this country and still be homeless, right? So it's like this, it's this added insult or whatever, and that only goes so far because it, it doesn't challenge imperialism and it doesn't challenge uh, whatever. But it does have this initial kind of push. But that explains. I mean, that that kind of like. I don't want to experience these things. I don't want to see my mother experience those things. I don't want to see my neighbors experience these things. I'm going to fight you. But let's go bomb Vietnam, right? That explains someone like John Lewis. That explains um, the deviation of the Amer uh, American GI and why the Brown Berets had to, and, and why anyone with international politics had to break away from the Lulex, from the American Jets. But it, it, they did play an important historic role, right? And so, like, um, I think that that's really. It's just telling. I don't. I don't really. I don't. Have, I don't have a point deeper than that. But so I. I did want to want to say that, that the Brown Berets break the politics of the Brown Berets break from the GI form, break from Lulac, and they, they break into this kind of um, this kind of internationalist uh, approach, right? They see themselves as a nation. They see themselves as a distinct nation, and they see themselves as a nation amongst the nations of the world, right? And so that's kind of. Um, it's really interesting in this moment to me because like all these people attack groups of people who they call nationalists, like nationalists, nationalists become this, this, this grand insult, but it is a group of nationalists who have the best, a lot of the people who describe as nationalists, not everybody, you know, some people, some people are horrible, but like a lot of people described as nationalists are the people who actually have the best internationalist politics simply because they know things. A lot of, a lot of the people who are attacking just don't know anything. So like, so, um, but, right. uh, but we're getting getting back to where we were. Yeah. So so the Brown Berets, uh, yeah, they formed in the 1960s. Um, there's a lot of controversy now as to like if you if you if you say one person's name, all these other people are gonna start fighting you. But let's just say they started in the 60s, late 60s, 67. Um, and what's going on around that time is um, there's the there's the obvious stuff, right? The obvious stuff like the the East LA blowouts, the the walkouts, right? Which is the largest walkout, uh, student walkout. Um, I think still the largest student walkout in American history. Um, that took place, you know, with the, the schools, Garfield, Roosevelt, Lincoln. Um, what year was that? That's 68, right? 1968. So that's 1968. And then, uh, uh, obviously, 1970, the Chicago Moratorium. Um, but then there's there's, there's, there's lesser, the, the larger, the broader context a lot of people don't really talk about. Um, and again, this is like the idea that I, I keep trying to, like, impart the idea of, like, getting beyond just, like, this this, this segregated thing, this, this thing where it's just they're over there, right? Um and that was what you brought up with uh, Miranda versus Arizona. I mean, Miranda versus Arizona applies to everybody. And the legal precedent from Miranda versus Arizona is Escobedo versus Illinois, which takes place in 1964. So these are two most important cases should you find yourself in cuffs in the United States of America. And they both involved, you know, whether they call themselves Chicanos or not, people of Mexican ex uh, extract, right? And they didn't just happen in random places. They happen places where there's a lot of Mexicans. I mean, like Escobedo, Illinois, 
happens in Chicago, uh, Miranda versus Arizona, in Arizona. So like that's uh, these 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 historic sites where 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 people where you know people were treated different because they were of of Mexican origin. So like those conditions gave rise to those legal struggles. Those legal struggles gave rise to things that we can all call upon, you know, such as our Miranda rights. That's really cool to know that the the walkouts by students of Chicano students in east side of LA is still, like you said, one of the biggest student walkouts in student history. And there's so much that we can learn today about Chicano organizing revolutionary activism during that time that was successful because this was a threat to U.S. imperialism ultimately because you're in the belly of the beast, you know, you're inside, you have the Chicano nation, which is kind of like a global South nation within an imperialist prison house of nations as the United States, right? As Lenin described, you know, imperialist powers being a prison house of nations with different, you know, in the Southeast, you have like African peoples who have been there for hundreds of years as who were formerly enslaved and, and they have their own nation and the Chicano nation is in a way its own nation as well. Um, and it's cool to see how the Bron Berets sort of understood the international context and understood that, you know, around this time period in the 1960s, you have the rise of the civil war in Guatemala, the, the Mayan uh, socialist uh, guerrillas fighting against the right wing uh, military dictatorships. You have the rise of the FARC in Colombia, right? You have the rise of uh, guerrilla movements in Honduras and Nicaragua. Uh, in Chile, in República Dominicana, you have these huge protests against the Marine invasion and the coup against um, Juan Bosch in the Dominican Republic. And so all over the world, and, and that's just in the Americas, you know, you have Africa and, you know, Angola, Mozambique, South Africa, like, you know, in, in India, you have like the rise of the communist guerrilla movements there as well. Um, and so it's just beautiful to see how at that time period, the, the Brown Berets understood that we'll have more of a chance of achieving true liberation by uniting with other oppressed nations, right? Because there's a difference between like Chicano nationalism and like U.S. nationalism. Totally different because one is an, an oppressor nation and one is oppressed. And so... Um, what was that connection between i'm hoping you can tell us a little bit about what work did the the berets have with the black panthers and the young lords in terms of practice right that internationalism well i think the first the first you know the, the, the it's kind of funny because because jesse jackson later took the thing but the first rainbow coalition took place in chicago right and that was with the black panthers the young lords and the white or the the young patriots the young lords and the black panthers right later on um uh, not too much later, uh, but a little later on, the Brown Berets and the American Indian Movement, and I think SDS, uh, uh, kind of joined in with the uh, with the uh, with the uh, with that that the Rainbow Coalition, the original Rainbow Coalition, not the Rainbow Coalition push. Um, so like that was the, you know they they saw pretty immediately. I mean obviously the beginnings of the Rainbow Coalition began in Chicago, began with who was there, right? And who was there? The Young Lords, the Black Panthers, um, and uh, the Young Patriots. So that was that kind of initial. Uh, group of people got together, but in not too short an order, uh, the Brown Berets, um, who were, were very much inspired by the Black Panthers, uh, as well as the American Indian Movement, um, they they also got involved because that was that was the place to be, that was the thing to do, right? And so, um, very very much, uh, this is a period of time where people very much saw themselves as uh, as 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 as. as you know, they were participating in a national liberation struggle that was global. You know, Che Guevara talked about let, let, let there be twenty Vietnams, right? And so, I think the Vietnamese are, are really one of the one of the great, uh, you know, one of the you know the victory of Dien Bien Phu and and and, and what that represented um, to people all over the world. You know, including the Chicanos, including even even almost like not directly, almost like. I mean, because they were aware of Vietnam, but like I would say, the people that most inspired the Brown Race. There's, you know, obviously the kind of the model, the Black Panthers, but you know, the the, the big thing that would probably be that that really lit up the, the the Chicano imagination was more likely the Cuban Revolution, right? And so, like, what that looked like, it was like, oh my God, these guys look like us, and they're 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 out there doing these things, right? Um, but the Cubans themselves deeply inspired by 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 the Vietnamese. So I think that you know the Vietnamese and, and the role that they played in, in in on the world stage, you know, like it, it's 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 hard to really. I think it's often lost because we can talk about the Vietnam War, we talk about just the 
horrible things the United States did to Vietnam, and you think about it in those terms, and that and that's if you're left. I mean, if you're if you're just like a general American, you think like, oh, we lost so many people in a stupid lost cause war or whatever. Um, but the 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 impact that uh, that you know the the Vietnamese uh, revolution, uh, its national liberation struggle had on the world is 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 it's very understated. You know, when when you think about it. even even when it's given credit, it's very understated. I mean, this was. This was an incredible event that 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 inspired so many people, um, not just not just in uh, not just throughout the world, but here in the United States as well. You know, I mean, yeah. It's a beautiful. It's one of my favorite socialist revolutions throughout history, like the Vietnamese people defeating, kicking France's ass, kicking the U.S.'s ass, uh, kicking Japanese imperialists out of the country, and it's inspiring to see and. Even around that time period of you know going back to this um, the sixties because I think the sixties is such a sixties and seventies is such a pivotal moment in the Chicano the history of Chicano resistance right um, you have the rise of the Brown Berets I think it's beautiful that around the same time the same year of the blowouts right nineteen sixty eight um, you have in Mexico in the F specifically the rise of the student movement protesting against you know um, the the dic- the dictatorial government the right wing controlled government the uh unfortunately the the slaughter of students right of of this massacre that happens in in mexico um and and you see the rise of revolutionary activism both in mexico and you know in what some would consider the diaspora um but what also you know may also be mexico as well but the same people the same nation divided by two by a, a u.s imperialist border and on both sides, they're waging revolutionary struggle. I think that's such a, a beautiful uh, internationalism or inter- internationalism in both senses of the word, if that makes sense. Right, inter- inter- yeah. inter- and, 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 and large and with the, with the incredible participation of the students, right? And so that, you know, this is around the same time that, you know, uh, UMAS is founded, um, which later becomes Mecha, you know. Um, and so this is like, you know, the, 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 the students were really really in many, many ways leading leading the way there. But I mean, a lot of that makes a lot of sense. So if you think about like historic periodization, what is going on, right? And what is going on right now? We're, we're talking about a period of time of, of, of great urbanization, right? We're taking people that's rural to urban migration has taken place. More people live in the cities now than, than than there. And what do you do when you get to the city? You fight for a piece of the city, right? Similar, I mean, it's not really all that different than the formation of the Black Panthers in Oakland. I mean, you have all these people migrating, you know, migrating from uh, from you know uh, rural areas in the South, um, moving into into Oakland in like you know the, the 40s and 50s, and their kids, they grow up in a city environment, right? And 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 what do they want? They want a, they want a piece of they want to they want to they want they want to participate um in it and then you know and then you know this is turned in the 60s where it's like maybe we don't want to participate in this maybe we want to overthrow it right but either way there's a proletarian response uh yeah. to uh to, to, to urban life right and so um a revolutionary proletarian response would be to want to overthrow things a more general proletarian response would be want to be get a part of it right so that's like what a lot of the civil rights a lot of the a lot of the stuff we've mentioned with lulac and uh mm-hmm. gi forum and they have and they have their uh, parallels in the NAACP, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, Urban League, things like that. Um, so like, but these kind of like uh, things where you're, 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 you know, I don't want to. The word integrationist is, is 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 so like, you know, pressed upon and, and, and chat upon. So I don't want to use that word exactly because what are we talking about? We're talking about people who want a better life for their children, and uh, whatever. So I don't want to like completely diminish that because it's, it's a natural impulse and instinct. So I don't want to like be like you're an idiot. Yeah, um, but. Yeah. Uh, but but it's not going to work, you know. You're 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 at the bottom for a reason, and they're going to keep you at the bottom, whether they do whether they do it in a a, a rural situation, or an urban situation, or a a, a city situation. Whether they're going to do it in the field or the factory, they're going to keep you at the bottom. So it's not going to work. So that's yeah. why revolutionary stuff is it's not it's not only moral, it's practical. I mean, we're always going to be at the bottom, and even if the twos and fews can escape, right? Even if a few people here and there can become professors and lawyers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, even your your family's not going to experience generational wealth. You know, I mean, you're you're not, you you, you know, like your extended family's not going to experience these things. So, it, you're you're still going to be part of a community that gets like every time you you break some barrier that you're not supposed to, you're going to be subject to all kinds of psychic abuse. Um, so, like, there's no way out of it outside of outside of like waging full scale revolution. And that's what kind of the politics of the of the of the brown berets um, were, were moving towards. They're moving and the, what they were part of, and it wasn't they're part of a world. That was that was looking that way. It's, it's in here in the United States, um, the 
these groups of people that were, you know, developing these ideas of an internalized colony were really moving in that direction. I mean, that the, the idea of internalized colonies predates it, but organizations were really organizing around like that's true. So let's do something about it, right? Uh, right. Uh, yeah, and it's like if you're trying to work within the imperialist system, like you're not gonna overthrow it; it's gonna take over you. And and I think I think you have the right Leninist approach in terms of being able to understand that it's anti-working class to judge working class uh, people of an oppressed nation for wanting a better life. At the end of the day, that's what socialists want. You know, we want better housing for people, better uh, living standards. But we also understand that a seat at the table um, is still, imperialism is still oppressive. It's not true liberation because it's built on the exploitation of other people around the world. Um, and so I think, as you correctly mentioned, like rev having a revolutionary uh, approach is like understanding the need to help out your people as they suffer through poverty, through police violence, um, but pointing them in, in, in the direction of, of real change. Going into, you know, the, the Brown Berets for me are one of the most interesting uh, figures in Chicano history that I think are very inspiring. Going into the the 70s and especially the 80s, I want to fast forward a bit because there's also another connection, kind of like how we talked about earlier between Mexico and Nicaragua with uh, the gold rush and the canal. Uh, there's another interesting connection now in the in the early 80s specifically, um, where in 1979, after the victory of the Sandinista Revolution, the U.S. begins funding these right-wing terrorists called Contras or counter-revolutionaries who funnel uh, drugs, specifically cocaine from South America, Colombia, Peru, and they begin uh, bringing it into neighborhoods like East LA, like South Central, like Harlem, um, you know, uh, inner city urban areas with oppressed nationalities, working class people. And now you have this operation called COINTELPRO, right? You have this massive crackdown by the U.S. state on revolutionary organizations like the Brown Berets, like the Brown, pa uh, the, sorry, the Brown Berets, the Black Panthers and the Young Lords. Um, the divisions that they foment, you know, between the revolutionary and the reformist wings of each respective movement and also someone rolling up to him be like, hey, do you want to make $5,000 a day? Sell this white stuff and, you know, have fun. And it's like, and it's all connected, right? Like you said, you know, the what happens one place happens in another. And the fact that the U.S. imperialists lost in Nicaragua, they had to use the, the Contras. Um, and then they were able to bring drugs, smuggle drugs into the barrios of working class Mexican people. And it totally wrecked the revolutionary Chicano movement in many ways. You know, uh, there was so many people who were affected by it personally, whether themselves or relatives. Um, people got caught up into uh, other um, uh, gang life and, and, and stuff that unfortunately, you know, moved away from the revolutionary um, view and, and angle. And so what was the impact of COINTELPRO on the Chicano people? Um, and, and like, w how have those divisions that were created during that time, um, how do they still affect us today, especially in the Southwest? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, the... the, the, the it, 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 not that different from 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 the way in which it was affected, uh, you know, the Black Panthers and, and and various other, you know, the American Indian movement, et cetera. Um, it's kind of funny though. I mean, like a lot a lot of the the divisions that were created in those times uh, to this day are kind of held. So like to even like and uh, and those divisions um, oftentimes are very petty. I mean, the, 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 what was one the first is tragedy, then is farce, right? And so like it's kind of like now it's just like it's very. I mean, the difference is, I mean, like we talk about the, the, the Chicano people and the mayor. I just, I'm just I'm just hesitant to talk about anybody from the 60s or, or anybody that was really affected that is still around doing things. Because the minute you say like, well, this person got affected, then, you know, you're going to have like five fingers pointed at you like, how dare you? And like, what do you really know? And like, it, it's like, it's like absurd. I don't even want to I I deal, deal with all that. But no, it, but it, absolutely. Cointel Pro I mean, had a very vested, had a huge vested interest in, 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 uh, in um in destroying the Chicano movement, I mean, you have you had you had a situation where the FBI was spying on uh, on the in the East LA blow uh, of blowouts, and we're talking about high school kids. You know, you had FBI agents like taking pictures of that. So like this is kind of like a yeah they they were they were they were they were investigating um um you know high school teenagers for for possible you know ties to the you know, Soviet influence. <laughs> you know, so that was a uh, that was a uh, 
that that's how they operate. That's how they think. And so there was definitely um, there was definitely that. I mean, like there's 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 so much that I kind of feel like I, I, we missed a little bit uh, in, in in the previous section of the conversation. But there was, there was one thing I really wanted to touch on before yeah. before uh, before we move on to um, that I forgot was the case of a uh, 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 Reyes Serena uh, in New Mexico. This guy led a courthouse raid in 1967. Now, a lot of there's a lot of controversy around him because he was trying to use Spanish land grants to, to get a hold of the land uh, in, in, in New Mexico. So he wasn't even looking at the Treaty of Guadalupe. He was looking at Spanish land grants with Spain, try to try to, to say, like, you, you need to honor these Spanish land grants to the U.S. government. Now, what's funny to me about, it, about that is to say, like, well, you see, this is evidence that the Chicanos are really just, you know, the descendants of conquistadors and they're not really indigenous, et cetera, et cetera. So he's just, like, cherry-picking things right there. But the interesting thing about Emilio Reyes, the, the arena, is that, you know, Malcolm X... It's very famous for having said, by any means necessary, right? Uh, Reyes Terrina, I'm not going to say he succeeded at any means necessary, but he tried any means necessary. I mean, he tried to use Spanish land grants, and he took rifles to a courthouse. I mean, he did that. And there, I think that the people talk about, like, there's a reason they, they teach you um, uh, um, uh, Malcolm X. Uh, I mean, there's a reason they teach you Martin Luther King, not Malcolm X. Well, I think there's actually – I think that they, they – that's true, that they're going to emphasize that. Um, but – there's a reason. There's a group of people who are taught even less than the Malcolm X's, even less than even Corky Gonzalez, even less than that. And that's people like Reyes Terrina. That's people like uh, I think Ron Williams. You know, um, you know, the, 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 with guns. You know, the, the that book. I mean, uh, Lolita LeBron. Those are people they really don't want you to know about. The people that shot it out with <laughs> the people that like fired on Congress and lived to tell the story. That's who they really don't want you to know about. The people that like actually like took arms here in the United States. And, and died um, in their bed, you know, as elderly people of natural causes. That's what they don't want you to know. That's what they really don't want you to know about, which is which is which is those 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 scared those stories of, of people that actually you know lived, they fought, they slipped away to live fight another day. That the, you know people dying in a heroic uh, you know like uh, cannon fire. Um, it's very inspiring, and I would never, I would never speak against it. I would never, you know, I would never tarnish anyone's memory. Um, but those stories are less scary to the powers that be than those who actually, you know, rose up and that was that, you know. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, well, just to wrap up, um, Matt, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. I think we've gone over a lot. Like I said in the beginning, forgive me if I have missed anything. Um, I myself am just really beginning to learn and study Chicano history and, and learn about it. And, and it's really cool. And what I wanted to ask you, Matt, is if there's anything I missed that you think is important to know in terms of any key figures or dates in terms of uh, the history of Chicano resistance that you think uh, our viewers and listeners should know about. Well, like moving, moving more towards uh, towards uh, the kind of the, the, the modern period, I mean, there's really interesting things like you could go to the UCLA hunger strike that happened in the early 90s. You could look at, um, you know, the resistance of Prop 27, again, the early 90s. You look at 2006 and the potential Congress. I mean, these are a lot of that. That's a lot about, you know, like immigration, you know, but like, but the reality is that like there was a, you know, enormous Chicano, you know, participation in it. Uh, you could look at, uh, uh, you know the the fight for Mexican American studies in Arizona. You can look at uh, you know uh, the fight against SB 1070, the fight against um, the fight against uh, George Pio, um, the fight against uh, you know, and you look at like the, the Donald Trump. I mean Donald Trump, the rise of Donald Trump, which he built an anti-Mexican platform. I mean you really look at like why was that anti-Mexican platform able to get to the national office? I mean normally speaking. That's a way of getting elected governor in in Texas. That's a way of getting elected governor of Arizona. That's a way of getting you know a mayor in Orange County or something like that. But that's not necessarily normally the path to the White House. Why was why was uh, warning the country about taco trucks in every corner and talk about building a wall on the Mexican border? Why was that the primary tool towards the presidency in in 2016? Um, I think that those are questions that that really need to to be looked into. It's not something that happened in the past. You know, it's not something that this is not a, a, a past and passing thing. This is something that is going into the future. And as this demographic shift takes place, um, uh, and it's not just the Mexicans, it's not just the Chicanos, it's just demographic shift uh, thing play, taking place that includes all kinds of people that would broadly be called people of color, um, but primarily driven by, uh, you know, people with brown skin and Spanish last names, uh, you know, as, as the largest group of people uh, that, that are pushing this demographic shift. Um, this is 
the politics of, of Trump, whether he's deposed, whether he wins another election, whether this, that, that's not going anywhere because that demographic shift isn't going anywhere. And so we have to prepare ourselves for the fact of the matter that this, these assaults on you know Mexican communities, on Central American communities, on Puerto Rican communities uh, that Donald Trump has, has himself embodied, um, he's just embodying them. Those politics and the primacy of those politics uh, are here to stay, and it's it's gonna it's it's and it's gonna get worse. So we have to steal ourselves for that battle. And there's so many figures in history to look back at, and Zapata, you know, Joaquin Murieta, and others, uh, and the Brown Braves. So many um, examples of resistance. The, the, the one I would, the, one of my favorites is uh, Modesta Avila. So, so I, w- I would encourage people to look into her. She w- she bombed a bunch of railways in, in Orange County. She was the first state prisoner uh, of in in, in in California. California's wow. first like federal held prisoner. Uh, but she, uh, yeah, she's the bomb. <laughs> she's the she's yeah. the bomb uh, bomb bomb uh, railways in, in Orange County. So that she's she's a really cool figure that I don't think gets the the same kind of the same yeah. kind of appreciation. Uh, that, that, that she should cool Matt um, on that note thank you so much for um, taking time out to speak with us today uh, we really appreciate it and we're glad to share this history of Chicano resistance we got to pass it on and spread it around with people with our people as Latin American and Caribbean people in the diaspora because there's so many examples of revolutionary activism and organizing that we can take inspiration from and our people now are dying from food, from disease, from racism, police violence, capitalism. And it's important that we go back and really observe these revolutionary histories of resistance because it can give us strength to keep on fighting now. And so we just spoke with uh, Matt Cedillo, who's an internationally touring poet and one of the four founders of Tele Jaguar. Make sure to go and follow Tele Jaguar uh, on social media, Facebook, Twitter, IG, their website. They have some really dope articles on their site. Um, Matt, thank you so much, and I hope you have a great week. Thank you.